We're ready to start the meeting. It is after 10. Article 1 is to elect a moderator to govern Sentown meeting for the year ensuing. What is your pleasure? There's a nomination for Ori Zanesworth. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all of those in favor of electing Ori Zanesworth as your town moderator for the following year, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Ori is elected and she thanks you greatly. <laughs> um, at this point, I would like any non-voters in the audience to raise their hand so that I can realize and your neighbors can realize that you should not be voting. You have to be on the Hardwick checklist. So anyone not on the checklist? We have one that I see. I see two. Okay, thank you. I also have, uh, at this time, would like to have the head table introduce himself, starting with Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Remick. Hi, I'm Kaylee Galloway Keene. I'm Sherry Cornish. I'm Elizabeth Dow. Opie, did you wish to speak now? Up, I think. Yeah. All right, I just have uh, something prepared here just to welcome everybody to town meeting and uh, I'd like to share just a brief high-level snapshot of my day-to-day -day goals and priorities related to town activities. Um, we currently have a great staff of employees town-wide making sure we have solid people carrying out our mission is very important to me. Having to find and hire people is costly and it takes away from the actual jobs at hand when you have to look for new employees. There are many towns near and far who are struggling to find solid people to do this work. Please take time out of your day to thank one or more of our great town staff as they, can, as they are all doing a great job. I'd like to give them a round of applause. Some of them are here. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna go down through um, some of the big bullet points. Um, so I'm gonna start with facilities. Uh, maintaining and upgrading town-owned properties. All projects are carried out with uh, energy efficiency in mind because the cost of fossil fuels and electricity will not decrease in the years to come. The memorial building will undergo a roof repair this summer paid, paid for by a historic preservation grant. The current state of the windows is one of the next items we will be looking at replacing and with the help of the newly formed and ever-expanding energy committee we, hope, we will hopefully be able to accomplish this task in the next year or so. The library will begin a long-awaited upgrade, which will allow for more people to access and benefit from that space. The public safety building heating system will need to be looked at in the near future. Again, with the help of the Energy Committee, we will be able to come up with a solid energy-efficient plan for that space. Our wastewater facility and the supporting infrastructure will have had a significant facelift by the end of the summer of 2023. This upgrade will provide for some moderate growth in town. I never knew that until I started working at a wastewater plant, how much this facility is related to many of the day-to-day -day aspects of town. And last, but certainly at the top of my list, the town garage. We are currently relying on a significantly outdated and tattered public works facility to house our most valuable assets to town operation. Our staff is currently exploring ways to leverage existing tax dollars for grants to fund the planning and construction of, the new pub of a new public works facility. In my opinion, we are currently on borrowed time with this building. Physical infrastructure. With the significant facelift that downtown got last summer, I would like to expand out to the areas that have had less attention over the years. Last summer, the town crew replaced an original section of sidewalk on the north side of Church Street. A Vermont Agency of Transportation grant allowed us to bring those sidewalks up to ADA compliance. I have received input from the Planning Commission and have also compiled the current conditions report from the road crew of the remaining sidewalks in town, which we will begin to priori prioritize the refurbishment of. Manhole risers and catch basins in need of rehab and or repair will be done on an as-needed basis. Those that fell in the area where the downtown paving took place have been rehabbed. We should all be thankful for that. In the very near future, I would like to start looking at ways we can fund and rebuild uh, streets like North Main Street and West Church Street in Hardwick Village 
and Main Street in East Hardwick Village, which we will in include assets below the surface as well during those rebuilds. Water and wastewater infrastructure is ongoing. We will begin to work on the lead and copper inventory in FY23, which is a state requirement asking us to inventory all private service lines to all water connections on the water system. A lot of this legwork has already been done for this, but compiling the information will be an ongoing task. Bridges and roads. We continue to bring our back roads up to state standards, which is going well. We used all the available grant and aid money in FY22, and we will use it again in FY23 to continue with bringing the remaining roads up to the standard. In the past year, we, we trucked in 1,176 yards of stay mat. I would like to continue with this effort as this material creates a more durable road surface in areas with increased slope. We are looking for funding sources to refurbish the bridge over the Lamar River in East Hardwick. The structures grant through VTRANS is a likely source. Similar to the sidewalk assessment, the road foreman has provided me with an inventory of failing and damaged guardrails on our roads. We will continue to develop plans to repair and or replace sections of guardrail that pose the most significant safety hazards first and work our way down from there. Our computer network. We invested in cybersecurity hardware for the town computer network and will be working with Champlain College's Leahy Center for Digital Forensics and Cybersecurity to do a no-cost cybersecurity and network security assessment of our town's computer network. <clears throat> in, closing, in closing, and most importantly, everything I have summarized here supports my ultimate goal and my position as the town manager of Hardwick. The safety and long-term well-being of this community and its visitors is always on my mind. Making sure our people have access to available resources and programs here in town is a priority. I always have my ear to the ground and will continue to support the groups and organizations of this community that are advocating for others. In closing, I'm going to say what I have said since day one. I am available to each and every one of you. Please come to me with your ideas and, more importantly, your complaints. If you have a question about something, please ask. I am available by email or phone, and I have an open-door policy at the office. With that being said, I look forward to town meeting 2023, and hopefully we can stir up some healthy and respectful conversation. For those of you looking for seating, there is some still here in the front. Before I start, I would just like to remind you of what's out in the lobby. There are different groups out there trying to get information to you and from you. And the Hardwick Historical Society is out there with coffee and tea. The Civic Standard has sandwiches, chips, and goodies, as well as a bingo game. And if you pick up one of their bingo cards, and you hear a word mentioned that is on there, and one can already be marked off, <laughs> then you get a bingo, you bring it to the table, and they'll decide what you're going to end up with. <laughs> and <laughs> they forgot seat. their prizes, so you'll probably get some goodies. And everything at their table is by donation. There's also a group looking for your thoughts on the park by the new bridge it will be going in. OP spoke of that with the swinging bridge going to be starting construction. There's the rail trail flyers, Yellow Barn, the Woodbury Granite Shed has a flyer. There's info on the gravel pit bond that is being voted on today. Northeast Kingdom Broadband has info as well as the window inserts. And the Conservation Commission has info out there. And I probably missed somebody, and I'm sorry, but you can get plenty of information. And also voting today is on the Hazen budget, the town budget, the select board, and Hazen school board members. And I'd also like to announce that at 11 o'clock at Hazen, they're going to start a blood drive. The Red Cross will be in town. And they put it on Front Porch Forum the other day, saying that they would still be available after town meeting. So go to finish up town meeting, have lunch, and then go donate blood if you're able. And we are following Robert's rules. And the most important one is if you want to be recognized, raise your hand, and I will recognize you. They will bring you a mic, and then you may make your comments. If we're doing nominations, generally, you can just stand and say whom you're nominating. Nominations do not need seconds. And we'll continue on from there. 
If you have any questions on what I'm doing, please raise your hand, say point of order, and I will explain what is happening if you're not sure what the procedure is for Robert's rules. And um, the other thing is we have some people here that are not Hardwick residents that are employees of the town. So if there is no objection, I'd like us to give permission to Mike Henry, our interim police chief down on the end of the table, and Casey Rowell and Amanda Fecto, who are over sitting with our town clerk. They are from out of town as well. So if there's no objection, if questions go to them, we will allow them to speak to the gathering. And now we'll continue on into the meeting. Article 2, shall the town accept the town report year ending June 30, 2022? There are some available. What is your pleasure? I have a motion from Dave Shepard to approve the report as presented. Is there a second? To support. To support. And your name, sir? Rob Lewis, didn't recognize you. Is there any discussion on the town report? Yes. Uh, Brad Perlman, um, thank you for the report. I think it's very informational. Um, if I can make a recommendation for next year's town report, if there's any way possible that the, that the board could include what the general fund, fund balance is, you know, going into this budget discussion, I think it'd be information that would be very helpful for us as taxpayers. And I know there might be a timing issue from getting the information back from the audit, so on and so forth, but whatever you can do to help us have that information in order to have this discussion, I think it'd be very helpful. Even a little section showing what the balance is, what the commitments are to it, and what's really available, you know, for this discussion would be very helpful. This mic should be handed out to one of the tops. Okay. Thank you, Robin. You're welcome. And we do ask you to speak, to wait till you, Robin gets you the mic. I can't move this. Oh, there it is. Okay. Is that better? So that uh, you can be picked up by everybody here as well as the camera. Is this live feed? The camera. The camera's live feed. Are you broadcasting or are you taping? No, okay, this will be taped so that people can watch it later. Any other comments or concerns about the town report as presented? Hearing none, all those in favor of accepting the town report, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Article 3, to elect all town officers in school district number 26 directors, which is Hazen, as required by public law of Vermont and the town charter. Again, the select board and union school district 26 directors are to be voted on by Australian ballot. And the first constable is a one-year term, and currently that office is vacant. So if you may also nominate yourself if you are interested in any of these positions. Do we have a nomination for first constable? And anyone that, any office that we do not fill, the select board will try to fill. Going once. I guess the office is still vacant. Does anyone want to volunteer to be first constable? I see everybody jumping on that one. The next one is second constable. You guys are going to be busy. Town agent. No nominations for that one. Surveyor of wood, bark, and lumber. Tree warden. How do you say his last name? Okay, I have a nomination for Jeff Fairs. Are there any more? He is currently in that position. I'll not hearing any more nominations. I'll close nominations. And all those in favor of electing 
Jeffrey Vayers for Tree Warden. Please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. And Jeff is elected. Cemetery trustees are located in the book on page four, just halfway down. And those, if someone would like to make the motion, could say they nominate the trustee, the uh, cemetery trustees as presented on page four of our town report and do it as a block. So moved. I have a motion for that. We do not need a second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor of electing the cemetery trustees as printed on page four in the town report, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. And the motion carries. The fire department officers can also be done in a block, and they are on the bottom of page four. Any nominations for the fire department officers? Are there any other nominations? I have a motion to elect the block as presented on page four. Hearing none, I close nominations. All those in favor of electing the officers of the fire department as presented on page four in this year's town report, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. And the fire department is elected as presented. Um, library trustees, we have a three-year term. Does anyone have a nomination? I didn't. I nominate Ross Connolly. Okay, I have a nomination for Ross Connolly for the for one of the three-year terms. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all those in favor of electing Ross Connolly for a term of three years as a library trustee, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Ross is elected. The second office to be filled is another three-year term. I nominate Daphne Kalmar. Repeat the name. Daphne Kalmar. Daphne Kalmar has been nominated. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all those in favor of electing Daphne Kalmar for a three-year term as library trustee, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. And Daphne is elected. Two years left on a three-year term for the library. I nominate Kathleen Sampson. We have a nomination for Kathleen Sampson. Is there, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all those in favor of electing Kathleen Sampson for two years remaining on a three-year term as library trustee, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion carries and Kathleen has been elected. We have another two years remaining on a three-year term for library trustee. I nominate Andrea Breitenbach. I have a nomination for Andrea Breitenbach. Is there any, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I close nominations and all those in favor of electing Andrea Breitenbach for two years remaining on a three-year term as library trustee, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion carries and Andrea is elected. We have one more to do that's another two years remaining on a three-year term for library trustee. I nominate Brendan Buckley. And we have a nomination of Brandon Buckley. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I close nominations and all of those in favor of electing Brandon Buckley for two years remaining on a three-year term for library trustee, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion carries and Brandon is elected. The last officer to be elected is grand juror and that is currently vacant. Does anyone have a nomination for that office? Hearing none, that would be another one put over. Did you have a question, Raymond? Okay, we have a nomination for Raymond Bellavance for grand juror. 
Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all those in favor of electing Raymond Bellavance for a one-year term as grand juror, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion carries and Raymond is elected. So the vacant ones will be turned over to the select board and they will advertise and try to get a Hardwick person interested in those. Article four, shall the town have its current taxes collected by the town treasurer? What is your pleasure? I move the town have its taxes collected by the town treasurer. I have a motion to have the town treasurer collect taxes, current taxes. Is there a second? Okay, I have a second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor of the town having its current taxes collected by the town treasurer, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Article 5. Shall the town vote a budget of $3,736,029 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town and authorize the select board to set a new tax sufficient to provide the same? This will be voted on by Australian ballot in the back of the gym. And, but we can discuss it now. And Eric, you said you wanted to talk to the budget? No, the budget is voted Australian ballot. No, no, no. It was not. No. There's not a ballot for the Australian for the budget. Okay, my mistake. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Oh. Coffee first. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, can you all hear me? Hello? Can you hear me now? All right. So, good morning. Thank you for coming out. Um, so, Think. I hope people can see it. Casey's got the um, the budget or part of the budget projected up onto the wall. We can try to use that um, to walk through if people have questions. Uh, I'll just give um, a very high level overview. So um, generally, when the select board is preparing the budget in the fall uh, for this meeting, uh, we have tried. Um, to keep the budget increase usually roughly in line with inflation or are we kind of target to be under 3%. Uh, the, this year and last year, inflation was quite a bit higher and um, this has affected the town as well as affecting everything else. So our costs for, um, uh, for materials are up, um, especially uh, fuel, heating fuel, diesel fuel, salt for the roads, health insurance is up uh, 20%. Um, employee salaries we want to increase in order to keep pace with inflation. So all these things uh, increase our expenses for the town. Unfortunately, the revenues um, haven't increased at the same pace. So our revenues are up about three, three and three quarters percent. Um, whereas our budget is up 4.8%. So the net result of that is um, a tax, a proposed increase to property tax to meet the budget of an increase of 5.13%. Uh, oh, sorry. I was looking at page, oh, I was looking at my notes and page 12. Um, so the, in pa the bottom of page 12 is projected up onto the board. Um, trying to think what else I wanted to point out. We had a few things that were moved around. So for example, we had um, some lease payments that were for equipment that we were paying out of our equipment capital fund. Our auditor suggested moving those to the annual budget. So you'll notice, um, I believe it's in the line items section that we've, uh, we now have 
some lease payments for equipment shown as an annual expense, and uh, we've decreased the amount going into the capital budget accordingly. Um, so it's just the same expense, we just shift it around where it appears in the budget. Um, also of note, uh, we are voting um, in the back by Australian ballot on a bond for a gravel pit. Um, the current budget that we're looking at uh, assumes that that vote passes, and, and so that's the scenario, since we couldn't do both. Um, that's the scenario the budget reflects. If the bond vote doesn't pass, then we're still going to buy gravel and maintain the roads. It's just we'll move from, the, from a bond payment to buying material. Um, so with that, questions, comments? David? I, I noticed the late David Shepard. I noticed the payroll has gone up about 15%, which is about double inflation. Is that a multi year labor increase contract or one year contract increase? So I don't think. So this is the increase for this year. I am mad. I'm not sure exactly where you're looking, but I don't think that the well across the board on all your departments, it's up about 15 percent on payroll. On payroll, yeah. Um, that would be in two collective bargaining contracts. Right. So we have two. So we have two um, unions where we do collective bargaining. They have three-year contracts. They were both up for renewal this year. And um, so those uh, for highway and police, those increases uh, are going to be for a three-year term. So no? Police Sorry, police is one year. And uh, public works is three. And public works is three. Thank you. I stand corrected. So is it going to be 15% for the next two more years? or? We're not seeing a 15% increase year over year after this. This is like an adjustment year. Correct? Yeah. Right. So, right. We're trying to keep, um, I guess, going back to what Opie said when he introduced uh, the meeting, um, we do feel like we are in a position where we need to retain workers. It's a pretty competitive job environment out there, and we value the folks we have, and so we're trying to pay them accordingly so they're not feeling um, underpaid, undervalued, and tempted to go elsewhere. And the VLCT passive, what kind of insurance is that? They cover our, so the VLCT passive is a, um, it's like a cooperative insurance where all, a lot of the towns in Vermont pay into um, a fund and it becomes like a self-insured fund for the towns and that covers our property and equipment assets. I think that's primarily what it covers, the making property and casualty. So it's not health insurance. Does that clarify it? Yeah. Okay. Because that's up thirty-eight percent. Yes, it is. These are these are yes, and our health insurance is up about twenty percent. It's um, yeah, increasing costs. Robin, we have one in the front. Oh, Bill, over here. Okay. Can people raise their hand when they'd like to speak? I'm in the back of the room, so I can run to you fast. But if I don't see your hand, I can't find you. Rob Lewis. Um, I was just looking. Pardon me? Can you stand, please? <coughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Rob Lewis. I, um, I see that the SAN budget has decreased by 19000 for the coming year, are we anticipating a free source or a mild winter? We are. So that's an, that's assuming that the bond vote for the gravel pit passes and that we have access to a year's worth of sand that is stockpiled on that site. So if the bond doesn't pass, then we have to buy sand. Then, then and we don't have to pay a, a bond payment, but we do have to buy sand Thank and you. gravel. Thank you.
Brad Ferland. Uh, my question has to do with the gravel pit, but how it impacts this budget. So getting back to my first comment earlier when I spoke, and I talked about fund balance, um, I think, if I'm correct, we have a general fund balance of, as of the end of this past June, June 30th, of $1.2 million. That sounds correct. And that's an accumulation of surpluses over, over the years. years. Yep. Where some years we have a surplus, other years not so, but anyway, the cumul accumulation of all that is $1.2 million. And, and which, which, is, which is the highest it's been in a very long time. And, um, and higher than our target is about 700,000. So yes, we're, it's, we're carrying more cash there than, yep. than we need to or want to. So I know as a town, we have a policy, I believe, that says that we should maintain a 10% balance of what our appropriations are. And then we, I think we have a goal of 20%. So in this case of having a one point, well, I don't know, was it three, three million? What's our total budget? 3.7 million? Yeah. So that would be $370,000 in uh, fund balance if it's 10%, which is our policy. And if you go to what the goal is, would be $740,000. So my question is, what, what are the obligations against that 1.2 plus million dollars? And as a possible alternative to bonding for the gravel pit, which even though we say it's a $500,000 bond, by the time we add the interest, I believe that's closer to an $800,000 purchase over You're 20 correct. years. So my question is, to what degree can we use a portion of that fund balance to reduce the amount we have to bond for and ultimately reduce really the money we're just throwing out the door for interest? And um, So that's so. a great question. Um, and. I'm going to respond while looking this way to try to get, oh, Opie wants to chime in. You want to I want to just fact check your policy. It's actually 15%. It's not 10%. It's, 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 where I got the 10% is the auditor's report. Where the auditor's laid out that we have a 10% policy. So that's where I got my 10%. So it may be 15, but if that's the case, then the auditor's report is incorrect. Okay. Um, so I believe... Um, and I'm speaking off the cuff, that our obligations, um, the select board has committed, I think, 200000 to the um, replacement of the swinging bridge. Sorry. Oh, 100? Okay, I overinflated that. And if you look at, uh, hang on, there's a page in here in our report, page 10, near the top, um, we had projected using $125,000 from the fund balance to offset property taxes for this year. So I believe those are the only two things we've... No? Oh, correct. So this, how much did we use this current year? 175. So, so 175, 125, so that's 300, and 100 for the bridge is 400. About seven hundred and sixty thousand in our fund balance at the end of this, the this fiscal year. We think seven hundred and sixty. You said we we expect to be the fund balance at the end of this fiscal year. So the, you're not. We're not building a FY. We're not being asked to pass a budget today that uses some of that surplus, are we? Where does that reflect that in the budget? It, it, it does not, is not reflected in the budget. It's reflected in the, I mean, in that, on that page 10 as a projection of taxes. So basically, we would raise taxes sufficient to cover the budget minus the 125,000, which would cause us to use 125,000 out of the fund balance. I would, I would just think that you would, we would see that on the page where you're showing your revenue sources, that a revenue source would be 125 or whatever you were talking about, 
from the as a balance. funding source mm -hmm. to build this budget because w there must be a hundred if, if that revenue source isn't on here right it's just misleading okay it doesn't seem to be as transparent as it possibly could be okay if you don't go back and look at those other statements yeah that where you did include it that's all okay so I, I think Noted. that gets back to my earlier point of to the degree you can including in this what the fund balance is in clearly stating what the obligations against it are so that we know going into this discussion exactly what we have available to use or not use or choose to use if we chose to um, for building this budget sure no so, I think that's a great suggestion to include the oops, fund sorry. balance in the town report and I appreciate it Page 47 at the bottom, but it's not highlighted. Okay, so um, on page 47 at the bottom is uh, the, the general fund balance as of June 30th, 2022. So it is in there, but it, it perhaps could be highlighted or it could be maybe moved up closer to the budget. Yeah, is that what you're thinking? Okay. So you <laughs> Yep. Yeah, maybe in future years we'll, we'll be able to move that um, closer to where the budget is and, and that would catch people's eye more. Any other questions or comments about the budget as presented? Robin? Oh. I'm missing the hand. Keep your hand up, please. Uh, Steve Fortman, uh, just can you describe the process uh, by which the purchase price of five hundred thousand was arrived at? Help. I'm, I'm looking to you for help. Yeah, that was. Uh, Opie, so this has been an ongoing process oh. for about six months. The the price was a little bit lower and then a couple things changed with a potential telecommunications contract and the price went up and stayed at 500,000. So there was not, not a lot of negotiation on that. There's, I think there's several other offers on the pit right now or potential offers if, if we're not interested. David Shepard, um, could someone explain how the police budget was built on the first three items where the base payroll was decreased, then the overtime was increased, and then part-time officers was dramatically increased by 476%, and I'd just like some rationale on that. Um, I'm going to look down the table, but I believe this is based on uh, the personnel that we actually had available to us. We have more part-time employees than we do full-time employees, full-time certified employees. So we're relying on part-time employees to cover shifts. It, then there's a cost benefit to us in doing that. We don't provide them with insurance, health insurance benefits. Well, it doesn't really pay off in your budget. That, that, but that's where we came up with those. But it, it, Finding full-time certified law enforcement officers right now is not an easy task. Uh, I would like to commend um, Mike the Henry end. for actually recruiting and hiring uh, a, a bunch of officers over the past year or so. It's been a huge success. But yes, we're still relying on um, part-time officers. I believe that, that that also helps having some flexibility in covering shifts um, and, and various assignments. It's being driven out of necessity, not out of choice. You know, it's who, right. It's who we can get. We're getting co good quality, qualified, part-time officers because we can't get the same in a full-time situation right now. 
I can run that again. I think I think Jennifer had her hand up earlier. Thanks. Jennifer Flegelman. Um, it's a small budget item, but I was just curious. I noticed that the fireworks budget was taken out of both revenue and uh, income, and I was wondering if those were being canceled or what. Yeah, um, so in the past, I believe the way it's worked is the town has contributed about $3,000 toward fireworks and looked to townspeople to supply donations to make up the remainder in order to get a show. This year, um, in the fall, we, we were informed that the minimum show was $6,000, and um, and we had to, you know, you have to commit now and all this, and we kind of said, enough. You know, we could commit money to the the Memorial Day festivities generally, but let's not try to keep supporting the fireworks as a town. That's not to say that some other organization couldn't go come up and and support the fireworks, but yeah, that was why it's that's why it's missing. Thanks. There was a hand over here first. This guy. This one, yes. Oh. I'll get to you. So Kaylee's reminding me that there should be $3,000 more in a Spring Fest allocation, generally. Uh, Paul Silo, I'm fo just follow up on David's uh, question with the police department. How many full-time officers and how many part-time officers are there currently? Yeah, so it's always a moving target. I'm going to look to Mike Henry to get the current, current numbers on that. And he's going to wait for a mic. <laughs> oh, maybe not. So there are like four full-time officers and four part-time officers. Plus yourself. I'm sorry? Are you one of the full-time? Or is that in addition to you? In addition to me, yes. Pollyanna Cooper Levangie. Um, I'm just curious as to what is um, the second step if the bond doesn't pass for the gravel pit. How will we continue to supply so, ourselves so we're, we're i think the select board is hopeful that the the voters will pass the bond um if if you all choose not to pass you the bond then uh we'll reevaluate and and we I, our options are we could so our current gravel pit is essentially played out we might get one more year of gravel out of it but that's about it so um at that point we could uh, we could essentially we could buy in material from from commercial pits in the area. Uh, most of them are a, a longer truck haul than the proposed pit. I would have just said we're going to pave all the roads in Hardwick, just to be funny. But <laughs> Karen Collier, um, Jennifer, to piggyback on your question. When the town of Hardwick decided that they didn't want to continue with the fireworks, the Hardwick Kiwanis Club stepped forward and um, decided to take that under their fold f along with the Spring Festival weekend. Um, so the town of Hardwick is donating the $3,000 that was in the budget to the Hardwick Kiwanis Club. Obviously, we're looking at another $3,000 we need to raise. Um, it was suggested that we start a GoFundMe because the town of Hardwick used to send out letters to people getting support for the remaining. Um, and we already do that for support of the Spring Festival, so we didn't want to do double whammy people, so to speak. We just found out we can't do a GoFundMe because Kiwanis Club, anyway, long story. So short story is if you want to support the Hardwick Kiwanis Club, the fireworks, the Spring Festival weekend, see Sherry Lucier, drop a check in the in the mailbox to Carter Kiwanis, and it will all go to Spring Festival. Uh, Vince Razzianelli, um, to kind of piggyback on a couple questions here. Um, how many fewer part-time police hours or overtime police hours would it take to fund the fireworks show? I assume that's a rhetorical question. No, I, I actually am curious for how much our police officers get paid part-time and overtime and how many fewer hours that would take. On average? It, it wouldn't take very many police officers. <laughs> what, what did you one day, say? One, no police coverage. Two, Two hours. hours a week? I don't know. Half an hour per day? I don't know. 
I'm asking the question, I don't know. I, I, the question is actually a financial question. So what is our part-time rate for police officers and what's our overtime rate? We can do the math. I, I have to say I don't know the answer off the top of my head because I haven't tried to equate fireworks with police coverage. Uh, Michael Lou Smith. Um, about the bond vote for the gravel pit, uh, I do support that. Uh, I'm just curious if there's reasons that we shouldn't take some of the funds from the general funds to offset that cost. That is a great question, and we still could. I believe if the bond vote passes, I believe the way it's worded is authorizing the select board to borrow up to 500000 for the purchase of the gravel pond, minus, you have the wording as... Yeah, not to exceed, and I think it also says um, that we can offset it with grants and aid, and so it could, we could reduce the amount we borrow, and... And you have reserve funds for part of the funding, too. Right, so we could. There's nothing to prohibit us from doing that, and if that's, you know, what people really want us to, to do, I guess we want to hear it. Does the excess that we carry over, um, what kind of interest does that make? Uh, Is it comparable to the interest we would pay on the bond? Probably not. Usually yeah. your interest so on us. So if we have the money now and we're not making very much money off of it, it might be better to spend some of that money and not pay as much interest? It might be, um, some of it. I think what we need to balance is we don't want to put ourselves in a position where we don't have any reserve because there are, even though over the past five or six years we've been building this reserve, we've actually been ending the year. The way the reserve gets built, the fund balance gets built, is when we end a year um, spending less than we had projected in our budget, and then any remainder goes into that fund balance. So the opposite happens some years. Some years we end up spending more than we had projected, and then with the, that overage comes out of the fund balance. So we need to keep something in there. Um, but yes, it doesn't have to all be in there. Miles Kamisher Koch, um, Opie or Eric, could you elaborate on how uh, telecommunications opportunity affects the purchase price of the gravel pit? Uh, I can't, but maybe Opie can. You, the question is about the telecommunications uh, part of the, that Opie mentioned about the gravel pit purchase. Right, so um, Kenny still owns the pit. So he's still um, you know, researching ways to bring in revenue. So if that happens prior to the purchase, then we have to deal with that. If not, then I believe it's a null and void. And the, I believe the telecommunications is more on the tele side, right? It's like the, the cell phone kind of end of things. Not a, it's not fiber optics coming to your no, house. It, it would be a tower. For that, you need to see Paul Fix out in the lobby who's bringing you fiber optics if you live at a certain address. Uh, Dave Gross, um, I have a question on the fund balance, or comments on the fund balance. A couple things, first of all. Um, it's my understanding for our matching portions for any grants we get that comes out of the fund balance, is that correct? If we apply for a grant and they say 20% matching, that money is off, is that from the fund balance? Not generally, no. Okay. Mostly it's, a, it's just like a, um, it's, it's what our savings reserve is or like a, for you know, basically it's for the event of an overage, a severe overage in a budget or several years in a row where we have expenses that are higher than predicted. Legally, are we allowed to use that money if, we, so if the select board decided that was an adequate way to um, do it? Yeah, legally it is money that is, it is town money. So if we, um, let's say there was a very uh, urgent need in the town a very big ticket item that we could have grant money for, which we would require to put up 10 or even 20% for, that money could actually leverage a huge amount of money into the town. I'm just pointing that out. The other thing I would like to point out is um, with the um, inflation rates, um, 
by having the gravel, going back to the gravel pit, by having that and it paying off in 20 years, it's very difficult to say what the interest would be because of the, just the general inflation rates. We'd be paying off the bond with much cheaper money if it would because each year that dollar we're paying off goes down by 6%, 5%, 4%, whatever. So doing a straight out calculation of what is what are we paying for interest on the bond versus say a, our year 15 payment is very difficult to do. You have to actually sit down and do the math. I think, Danny, did you want to say something? Do you want to wait? So the fund balance is necessary, for example, if we had another COVID incident and the federal government didn't give us all that free money. Um, and that, COVID was also one of the reasons that that fund balance grew exponentially in the last three years. Um, traditionally, I mean, in the last couple of decades, we've worked very hard to, to keep our fund balance. Um, so, and I believe I heard someone say, that after this end of this fiscal year, our fund balance is actually going to be right where we need it to be, um, which means we don't have any money to for the gravel pit. <laughs> Please return to your seats and fasten your seat belts. Prepare for takeoff. Uh, Brad Furl, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but um, 700 and, I, again, I think the policy is, and I guess you guys have to tell us what the policy is. It's your policy. I think your policy is that we have 10% of our appropriations in reserve, which if, if it is 10%, then that would be $370,000 to have in a reasonable reserve to cover unexpected, unexpected expenditures. And generally that is to close out the year. If we're running short on revenues or high on expenditures, uh, you close out the year in the black or at zero. And to have, because um, I don't think you have just the authority to go ahead and spend that money if you decide halfway through the year to spend an additional two hundred dollars to $300,000 if, if we're not going to have a deficit during that given year. Because we're, we're not giving you really the authority to spend that next year, um, unless it's the closeout. So that may be stated, I should state that more in a question than, than in a statement. That, you know, what does the, um, you know, the gentleman over there was talking about grants, using it for a match, for a grant. But if we haven't authorized you guys to spend that match through this budget process, you know, how would you spend that match? Would you go into the fund balance and, and, and spend it if we didn't discuss it here at town meeting or not. So those are just questions. Now that we have that big of a balance, I think having a better understanding of how we can use it and how we use it would be very helpful for all of us. Um, $750,000 is a lot of money to have sitting in a cash balance when you're asking us to pay an increase in taxes. And, and with the increase in taxes is fine. That's going to happen. But when almost 300,000 of that over the next 20 years is due to interest on a $500,000 bond. And if we can avoid that $300,000 or a large percentage of that $300,000 by using some portion of that fund balance, then I think we have to think seriously about doing that. I think it's a very reasonable usage of that fund balance. Therefore, unique one-time expenditures or emergency expenditures. And this is a very unique opportunity to buy a gravel pit that we may never have again. So using the fund balance to make that kind of one-time expenditure, I think is a very appropriate use of that fund. So that's, that's all. Um, Kaylee has a comment. Oh. You're up, Ray, you're up. Did you raise your hand? No. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. I just want to. Oh. Okay. Is there a janitor or anyone from Hardwick Elementary that knows how to shut off our noisemaker? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'll have to stand on my tiptoes because I couldn't get the little lever down. Um, so <laughs> I just want to make a couple of really quick comments. Um, 
Brad, that we are allocating 125,000 of that to lower taxes. Um, and we already mentioned that was on page 10 of the fund balance. I also wanted to mention um, there were a couple of comments about grant matches. Those often, when, they're, when they come to the select board, we talk about money that's already been allocated to line items and how that can be used as a match. Um, so it's very rare in my experience that we've had to talk about using that fund balance for a grant match. Um, and I also wanted to just reiterate what came up earlier. Essentially what we're asking in the bond vote is to spend up to $500,000, which is, what, that, which is what, what the cost is. I think we've heard a lot today that as much as we can get that down from a bond, we'll try and do that. Um, I don't know if we can promise anything today, but that's what the big ask is. Can we spend up to this in a bond if we need to? So I just want to reiterate that again, um, and thanks for all your questions. This is a good and lively discussion about the uh, gravel pit, but let's keep, and any other questions about the budget are welcome too. Oh, yes. <laughs> My name is Nancy Shade. I live up on Bunker Hill Road, and I think this is a long-term investment, and to think of it that way, your children might benefit greatly by this in the future. And uh, maybe someday we will by having stay mat roads. So uh, maybe some of these dirt roads that we all ride along will be saving us money on our cars. <laughs> so uh, I, I, am, I think it's a good idea to purchase this um, gravel pit. It's an opportunity of a lifetime. I just want to make a clarifying point on the follow-up that the gravel pit as permitted currently through Act 250 allows for extraction of gravel and sand, but um, if in order to crush ledge, when there is ledge on the property that is accessible and would make good crushed ledge and stay mat material, we'd have to get a, an Act 250 permit amendment, which we would intend to do Brendan Buckley, uh, Eric, what's the projected lifespan of the gravel pit? Um, so at our current rates of use, which um, I got from Tom at about 4,000-ish yard, 4,000 cubic yard or higher, uh, 4 to 4,500. You told me 4,500 on the phone. We don't actually do about 7,000 yards out of our pit. Right no, now. For uh, gravel or sand? But you said about 4,000 in winter sand and about 7,000. That's for one year. So, okay, so the, so for at our current rates, which are about 4,000 yards of sand and 7,000-ish yards of gravel, we project that there's a, a well, we had a consultant um, help estimate that there should be about, at those rates of extraction, about 20 years worth of material that's easily accessible. Um, that does not include uh, processing ledge, which would be an uh, additional material beyond that, but for which we would need a permit amendment. Thank you. And just uh, perhaps we can dip into the fund balance for some more microphones. <laughs> Um, I think Lu over here. Oh, yeah. okay and next Lu Lynn Gedanken um, in terms of and following up on what Brendan was saying if this is a pit that's going to be producing for 20 years it makes sense to finance it with a bond for 20 years because the people who will be benefiting will be the people who will be paying and to fund it out of current revenue means that people now will be paying entirely for the pit there we go, a different perspective on, uh, on financing and how, how that impacts people. Hi, Lucian Avery. Um, I wasn't sure how much we're allowed to discuss the gravel pit if it's being uh, voted by Australian ballot, but it sounds like we're into it. So um, I had some, some questions about it. I looked at the... Um, I the, cannot um, hear your question. 
Would you start my, well, my first question was how, how much we're allowed to discuss something that's being uh, voted on by Australian ballot. Okay, the, if you the are bond... voting on a money item, we may discuss it. If you're voting on personnel for offices, we may not discuss that. Okay. So, um, so I looked at the, the report um, that, the, that you all got for the gravel pit, and um, I talked to um, some people about the Morrisville gravel pit, and um, so a bunch of years ago, they bought a gravel pit, and they did, um, it sounds like a similar thing where they dug down with an excavator, and they thought they had 35 years of gravel in there, but it ran out after half that time, and so they just had to do a permit amendment recently. Um, so digging down with, my understanding from, from the talking I was doing was digging down with the excavator only gets you down, I think he said 15 feet in the, in the report. Um, but another way to figure it out is to um, actually bore down with the boring and go all the way down to ledge. And that gives you a way better idea of what, what um, is actually in there, what kind of material, how deep it is. Um, and then the other thing it gives you um, is, um, is how deep the water level is because you have to be at least three feet above the groundwater level. And so it's hard to tell that if you don't hit water while you're going down with an excavator, you don't know how, where the water level is. And it can, it can vary, water level isn't really flat under, underground. So um, anyway, so just a concern I wanted to raise about, about that I feel like it wasn't explored a lot. Those borings are more expensive. Um, the, um, the other thing is the reclamation of the pit, because it looks like there was um, uh, some, from what I read, it looked like there was topsoil sold off already. And so I didn't know, and I didn't see in the report whether he said whether there was enough topsoil there to reclaim the pit or not. Do you know if that's the case? My understanding is that there, if we buy the pit, there will be sufficient topsoil left on the property to reclaim the pit. Okay. And do you know if the pit's actually in compliance with Active 50 now? Fully in compliance? Yeah, and it was, yes. Okay, good. Thanks. Are there any new questions or comments that haven't already been raised? It just looks like in the report given it was 14 years that it's projected to last. That's so. Yeah, so that's correct. He used um, a higher number for gravel than we actually, so I believe he has um, 10,000 cubic yards of gravel a year and we just the last several years have done 7,000 cubic yards of gravel a year. Um, so it depends on your rate of extraction basically. Ray Balavant. I was just wondering it, how much gravel is under those solar panels they stuck up there? Yeah, so that's a great question. That um, area of the old pit, so he's referring to the um, old pit off Billings Road that now um, the part of the pit that was done and reclaimed is now covered with solar panels that are producing electricity for us. Um, that uh, so it's interesting that you bring that up because we had at one point thought part of that pit might go deeper and we actually thought, well, if there's a, a big reservoir of gravel there, maybe there's a secondary water source. So we hired somebody to come drill and see if we could make that a backup water source if we ever had a problem with our wells. It turns out that right below the surface there is bedrock and so there's not a lot more material under those, under those solar panels. Anyone that has not spoken, do you wish to speak now? Any new comments, questions, or concerns? One I'll take one more, more Just one comment. More. Okay, thanks. Did you ever check in on Willie McAllister's gravel pit? He's got a nice one down there, and it's close to Hart, right? Uh, I have not. I did not realize that there that it was for sale, but. Uh, we're, I, yeah, there, I'm getting word that there's not more gravel there. Are you ready for the question on the town budget? I have a motion and a second on the floor. You want your book? This is mine. I have a motion on the floor for a budget for the town of Hardwick of $3,736,029 for the um, fiscal 24 and to authorize a select board to set a new tax rate sufficient to provide the same. All those in favor of Article 5, please signify by saying aye. Oh, 
It is for fiscal year 24. We're in fiscal year, we're in fiscal 23, right? So it is fiscal 24. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, again, all those in favor of Article, four, uh, Article 5 has been read. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Originally? Who made the original motion? We need your name for the minutes about an hour ago. I did not write that down. Pardon? Dave Shepard made the motion. Okay? And the next articles 6 through 18 are the appropriations. There is a way to do them without individually discussing each and every one, unless you wish to. But as moderator, I can suggest that we take articles 6 to 18 as a block. And then if there is a particular appropriation you would like to have pulled and discussed separately, we can also do that. I'm going to take a straw poll. How many of you would like to do Article 6 to 18 as a block? Those opposed? It looks like we're going to take 6 to 18 as a block. Are there any of the articles that anyone would like to take out and speak to specifically? Rob? Can you tell me the last time we increased the AWARE appropriation? The appropriations that are in here come directly from the organization themselves. So that was their request. I don't know when we've increased it. A Amy? Yes. Hi. Um, I'd like to speak um, to, to two of them, actually. I was reading in here about um, our appropriation to which, end. Which number? Uh, number 16 and number 18. OK, we can pull 16 and 18 for discussion separately. OK. Are there any others that anybody wishes to speak to individually? If not seeing any hands, then we will take articles 6 to 15, article 17, and article 8, and that's it, 16 to 15, and article 17 as a group. And the motion would be to approve these articles. I will read them, but to approve these articles as presented. So I will read the articles without Article 16 and 18, because they have to be read into the minutes. Article 6, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $4,500 for the support of the Greensboro Nursing Home? Article 7, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $3,500 for the support of AWARE? Article 8, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $2,500 for the support of the Lamoille Family Center. Article 9, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $3,000 for the support of the Hardwick Historical Society. Article 10, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $3,161 for the support of the Northeast Kingdom Human Services. Article 11, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $2,500 for the support of the Hardwick Area Food Pantry. Article 12, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $2,600 for the support of the Caledonia Home Health Care and Hospice. Article 13, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $3,000 for the support of the Hardwick Community Television Channel 16. Article 14, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $3,400 for the support of the rural community transportation. Article 15, shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $4,500 for the support of the Northeast, and there was a typo there, it's the Northeast Kingdom Council on Aging. Article 17, 
shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $1,500 for the support of the Crassbury Community Care Center. What is your pleasure on the articles I just read? Dave Shepard moved. Who, is there a second? Rob Lowe seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, and I'm not going to reread all the articles. Hearing none, all those in favor of the articles that I read, which are articles 16 to 15 and article 17, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. And articles 6 to 15 and article 17 have passed. Now we will go to Article 16. Shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $2,100 for the support of the North Country Animal League? What is your pleasure? Amy? Um, can I speak to the two? You have to make a motion first uh, to get it on the floor. Um, so I move that we... Approve. Oh, then move to approve? We need to approve the... Art we need to get... A motion on the floor so we can discuss the article. I have a motion to approve the article as read for Article 16. Is there a second? And I have a second. Do you wish to, whoever made the motion, do you wish to speak to this issue or do you pass it to Amy? Okay, now you may stand and speak. Thank you. Um, so this stand, is, please. Oh, sorry, this is the first time I've actually gone into the weeds and read all of these proposals, which are really great. But I've noticed that um, that the proposal for NCAL in 16, and can I mention 18, which is for Justice for Animals, which is a local organization, um, is that Justice for Animals was asking for 1,000 and NCAL was asking for 2,100 to serve four dogs in our community, where I'm sure Justice for Animals served many, many more. And so my concern was, is there a way that we can flip it and give NCAL 1,000, because we should be supporting them. Um, they have a lot of support from their community and do the 2,100 for Justice for Animals, um, which is a local organization, which obviously can use the money um, as well. The way to handle that would be to do an amendment to the article and change the dollar amount. I want to do that. Okay, so you want to... <laughs> I, I, I am able to put words in her mouth to help her do it her It won't be intent. the first time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, at, let me get the... She's got the floor, so we're putting an amendment on the floor. Okay. So you want to make an amendment that the amount in Article 16 is changed to $1,000? Yes. Is there a second to that amendment? We have a second. Um, someone over there wish to discuss that? Yep. Uh, Sherry Olmsted. Every three years, I have collected the NCAL. Speak into the mic, Sherry. Sure. Every three years, I have collected the NCAL appropriation signatures. Hardwick is fortunate to have access to a large indoor shelter that receives and treats lost, injured, or surrendered animals. I also was there at the very first meeting of Justice for Dogs and okay, have been- Okay, we are discussing the North Country Animal League. Yes, but th these two are intertwined. May I continue? Yes, you may. I was also there at the very first meeting of Justice for Dogs and have been a member since then. It's a young organization and they need funding and time to grow. But their purpose of filling the gaps on dog res rescues is praiseworthy and their request is modest far beyond the work they do. Hardwick benefits from having both organizations in the same way that there is a benefit from having Copley Hospital reachable in Morrisville and also the Hardwick Health Center here in Hardwick. One organization doesn't cancel out the need for the other. I would like to continue because I have some very relevant problems with dogs that feed into both of these organizations. May I? Does the group object? Okay, yes, you may. Hardwick does have a dog problem. Years ago, town clerk 
Alberta Miller never hesitated to say that only about half of Hardwick dogs were licensed and vaccinated. She was proven very correct 10 years ago in 2013 when the efforts of a very persistent animal control officer resulted in the town report listing 745 dogs. In the 10 years since then, due to poor health, lack of an officer, and a couple years of COVID, that number of 745 is reduced by over 400 dogs, down to only 329, as you can see on page 19. We need to ask, why is it Vermont law requires a rabies vaccination? Why do most nations not allow dogs to be brought inside their borders without a quarantine period? Why does the Vermont Fish and Game Department regularly fly overhead and distribute rabies vaccination bait drops? What do they know? What have they learned? about the damage one rabid fox can do if it makes even brief contact with one unvaccinated dog, perhaps at night, in the backyard, out of sight. As rabies develops, it is often not visible on the dog. There is plenty of time for any human to feed, water, and touch the dog, perhaps accompanied by a child. Neither the child or adult will immediately show signs of infection. If rabies is not caught in time, it is always fatal. Any other comments in regards to the amendment to change the dollar amount in Article 16 from 2100 to 1000. Uh, Dave Gross, um, I arise to oppose this amendment. I think that each of the agencies has given consideration of what they think is appropriate and what they're asking us to uh, grant them and for us to second guess it and try to shift things around is kind of inappropriate because we're not really informed. So I would say vote no against this amendment and vote yes on the original request for the allocations. Thank you. Any other, over here, Hopi? I used to have animals, I don't have them now, so this doesn't really affect me. My name is Robin Leslie. Um, I do think that we should uh, vote this amendment down. I agree with Dave that, um, in fact, the organizations know what their population base and their needs are, and they ask appropriately. Uh, voting this down doesn't change the opportunity if Amy would like to um, increase the funding for Article 18. Um, just because this year, I think it said that it only uh, that organization only handled a few cases from Hardwick doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the capacity to always be available, and in some years we might need them to handle more. So I think we should give them the original funding, vote this $1,000 appropriation down, and then go and vote for the 2100. Lynn Gedanken, I would echo what, what Robin just said. Uh, NCAL provides more than just adoption services. They provide food for people who can't afford food for their animals and a host of other services. And I think we should vote the amendment down. Any other comments in regards to the amendment changing the dollar amount from 2100 to 1000? The process is we vote on the amendment. How that comes out determines the main motion. So currently you are voting, those in favor of amending Article 16, as I read, to change the dollar amount to $1,000, please signify by saying aye. 
Those opposed, nay. The motion to amend fails. We are back to the main article as printed in the book. Any further discussion on Article 16, which appropriates $2,100 to the support of the North Country Animal League? Hearing none, all those in favor of Article 16, as I just read, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. And the motion carries. We're now on Article 18. Shall the town appropriate a sum of money not to exceed $1,000 for the support of justice for the dogs? What's your pleasure? Who said that? Dave Shepard? Is there a second? I have a second from the other Dave. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of appropriating a sum of money not to exceed $1,000 for the support of the justice for the dogs, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. <laughs> and you have, in essence, approved all of the articles from 6 to 18. They have all passed. Thank you. Moving on to my favorite two. Article 19. Shall the town, appro shall the town authorize a select board for the period of one year to enter into contracts with new industrial and commercial owners, lessees, baileys of real property, or with existing or new owners, lessees, baileys, or operators who construct, acquire, or renovate industrial and or commercial real property, including additions to existing property for the purpose of fixing and maintaining the municipal rate applicable to such real property, or for the purpose of fixing the amount of money which shall be paid as an annual municipal tax upon such real property, pursuant to the provisions of Title 24, Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 2741. What is your pleasure? So Rob says, so moved. Is there a second? And I have a second from Dave. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of Article 19 as previously read, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. And the motion carries. Article 20. Shall the town authorize a select board for the period of one year to enter into contracts with operators of agricultural real property or with existing or new owners, lessees, baileys, or operators construct, acquire, or renovate, or who intend to construct, acquire, or renovate agricultural real property for the purpose of fixing and maintain the valuation of such real property in the grand list, for the purpose of fixing and maintaining the municipal rate applicable to such real property, or for the purposes of fixing the amount in money which shall be paid as an annual municipal tax upon such real property pursuant to provisions of Title 24 Vermont Statutes Annotated, Section 2741. What is your pleasure? We have Ron Wiesen says he moves the article. Is there a second? Rob says second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of Article 20, as I previously read, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion is carried. And am I glad my English teacher isn't here to make me go through that sentence? Article 21, to transact any other non-binding business proper to be brought before said meeting. This is where we can discuss at will. The only thing that is legal in this article is to adjourn. Paul. All right, I'll just come up front. This, this might take, it'll be easier. You still need the mic there. I think you want your podium. Can I? Can you I, want my podium? You don't mind. That, Sounds like long winded. You have. No, it's well, you don't have to move. Okay. Paul is with the New England Broadband, which promises to. So, Northeast Kingdom. What did so I say? Good morning, folks. Is it still morning? I guess so. So, I'm Paul Fix. I have been appointed by the town select board to. Hi, I'm Paul Fix. I've been appointed by the town select board to be your representative to Northeast Kingdom Broadband. 
So we're a community-owned, publicly accountable broadband provider, all towns in the Northeast Kingdom, plus Wolcott, are members and have a voice. We're committed to delivering fast, reliable internet service to every unserved address with utility poles. So if you're served by electric or wired phone service, we're coming to you sooner or later. By the end of 2024, we'll be providing service in parts of 45 of our member towns across the Northeast Kingdom. Initial construction focused on the backbone of the fiber optic network to maximize reliability of services for the entire district. For anyone who is on internet that's slower than they'd like, I think the places we're not going to go in a hurry are where Comcast goes already and where um, uh, well, Consolidated is offering only 4.1, so we'll be going where Consolidated is. There's some people on fiber through other services that we won't serve either. Um, so Hardwick Select Board appropriated $139,500, or was that the Greensboro appropriation? That's the Hardwick appropriation, to um, accelerate the build. So at this point, Hardwick is one of the towns in our second construction grant. Parts of Hardwick should have service by the end of the year into the first quarter of 2024. Other parts of Hardwick will have service during the summer of 2024. We expect to build over 10 miles serving 305 premises. Portions of Hardwick along the backbone in the southeastern portion of the town should have service by the end of the year into the first quarter of 2024. Portions funded by the ARPA fund build should have service during 2024. So those portions that are along Route 14 and Route 15, ARPA funding will be up Bridgman Hill and out Route 15 across to Pumpkin Lane. Route 15 will go as far as the south end of East Hardwick along Route 16 there, I should say. And then uh, parts of West Hill, most of the way up to that intersection way up there, which, which road I don't recall right now, uh, by Wapanaki, yes. So anybody who is currently receiving service via Consolidated could stop in the hall, I'll be out there right after this meeting, and fill out your address so you get notified when we're coming to you. Also, this is really important, we're using the number of signups as objective criteria for interest in the town, and that's in addition to people who've reported the need for service for work, working from home or having students in school, things like that. But if you stop and add your name to the list, it will show our interest in Hardwick versus interest in Wilkett or you know, Island Pond or whatever. So that will help us bring internet sooner, even if you decide to go to Starlink and use them until that becomes available. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, yes. Oh. I've lived up on Santa Road since I moved back uh, to Vermont 15 years ago. And I keep hearing, uh, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, any idea when the gap is going to get filled between Greensboro and Hardwick? The, the plan at this point, I'm just trying to look at my... It won't be before the end of 2024, but this whole project should bring Internet to everyone who is unserved or underserved in Hardwick within five years at this point. The difference, I think, now is that as a public entity with a board composed of people in your town rather than a for-profit entity that's serving and cherry-picking the profitable places, we've received $60 million for the Northeast Kingdom in public funds already. The whole build should take us about $150 million. Once we have service in those higher density places we're now reaching, we'll be able to go to the bond market to fund that expansion 
into the more rural spots. So it's not great news, we won't be there next week, but we're coming. Wasn't there a study uh, commissioned this current year for cell service, for example, to get to underserved areas? I'm not concerned about Burlington. I'm not concerned about Montpelier. Those have more options. We have zero options other than to go to HughesNet and have them put up an antenna for why is it sort of as backwards? So I think on Center Road, you're seeing some of the reason why wireless cell service isn't working. So VTEL has a tower, or is on the antenna tower on Bridgman Hill. You have to have mostly line of sight from there. So if you're down in a valley along Center Road, that tower that's only a couple miles away can't reach you. So the cost of putting towers everywhere is a problem. And to, for the tower to work, fiber has to come to the tower anyway. So in the long run, it's much more effective to wire you to the fiber optic internet for, for better long-term service. They, it would have to come near you to get into your valley anyway. So that's, that's the answer. Nancy, did you have a question? As you come up West Hill and onto uh, the West Hill Road and over to Tucker Hill, um, will that include um, Bunker Hill? Because we're close to Wolcott and we're close to Hardwick, so we kind of have a little blind spot there with Consolidated. You'll, you'll be in the n a following phase. Your service won't happen until at least 2025 at this point, up in that area. Hey, let me fix that for you. I'm going to interrupt Paul for just a minute. As you leave the meeting, please stop at all of the information booths out in the lobby and find out what's happening. And there is lunch out there. All right, so I'm one of those information booths in the lobby. So let's take other questions one on one out there and let the meeting move on. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Is there anything else anybody would like to bring up at this time before we adjourn? Okay. Um, uh, Rose Friedman, uh, I just wanted to kind of open up a, a discussion a little bit about um, growing and supporting town meeting in general. Um, I've been reading a lot about what other towns in Vermont are doing to kind of bring back their town meeting after COVID. Um, many towns have moved it to a different day, including Monday evening, Sunday afternoon, um, brought in child care support, done a shared meal afterwards. Um, some towns do like an informational meeting, like a very informal discussion the night before their town meeting with uh, information tables from a lot of area organizations and a pie auction. And everybody's doing fundraisers at the same time and then they do the actual proper meeting the next day. So just reading a lot about the very creative ways that people are dealing with trying to get more people to show up and make it more accessible. Um, I just wonder if we have any thoughts as, as a community about ways we could do that. Um, if there is any interest in moving it, um, ways to support child care, and other thoughts that people have. Can they talk with you out in the lobby, Rose? Sure. Rob? Are we, going to, are we going to see Chip, or did I miss him before I came in? I didn't hear you. Chip Troyano. Chip Troyano. Is, is oh, yes. Chip was supposed to be here, but I have not seen him, and we're kind of ahead of schedule from when he's usually here. And I did, he did contact me, and I told him if we were still in session, he could speak, but he was supposed to let I me. Mean, is he here? Oh, Lucian. Yeah. Chip, are you in the room anywhere? then I guess we won't be hearing from Chip today. Yeah, hi, I'm Lucian Avery again. Um, I just wanted to let people know that the town of Hardwick still has a few 911 signs available. They're green signs. They have um, real reflective um, white letters on, uh, numbers on them. And um, they're free through the, through the town. And you For 911? Uh, for 911 numbers. 
Yeah, they're, for house numbers. Yeah, for house numbers, so that um, you can be found basically when you want to be found. And where would they um, go and, to get those? And um, you can get the, the sheets at the town manager's office, and you can also see on the website. There's a little. If you have to click through, maybe one page okay. or something to see it. Thanks. So if you need a 911 sign for your home, so that when you call rescue, fire, or police, they can find you quicker. Check in at Opie's office. Next. Hi, um, I'd just like to share an observation. I don't have a, a solution for it by any means, but um, one of the things that I've noticed um, last summer and mostly during the summer during, during nicer weather is that as I drive through the village, I see a lot of people trying to navigate leaving the parking lot by the village restaurant, trying to walk up Wilkett Street and cross under the red light. And I don't come through the village a lot, but when I do, I see that a lot. So people who are in the village probably see it a lot more than I do, but I've seen some very close calls. With, so I don't, I don't know how we can somehow direct people away from trying to walk up Wilkes Street and trying to cross directly under the red light, but it just seems to be happening a lot more, and I think it's just a matter of time before something might happen. So. OP will pass that on to the police department. I, I've mentioned it in select board meetings, and it's and important there are crosswalks. that we cross at the crosswalks. Hi, my name is Erin Rosenthal, and I just want to say that the suggestions Rose just mentioned about town meeting, making it more accessible, seem really great to me. Um, I've been a resident of Hardwick for about 13 years. And town meeting and its procedures is really still new to me. And um, I would really benefit from that also as a mother of young children. Um, and also um, that recently at Woodbury School, they hosted a, a mock town meeting. And I just think it was so wonderful for the kids. Um, I'm not sure if that's a new thing in the schools, but I would love to see that continue every year because I think if the kids grow up um, understanding how the meetings work and how they can have a voice, it's just a wonderful, um, it's going to have ripple effects that will increase participation in town meeting. So, thank you. Thank you. Dave? Hi, Dave Gross. Um, switching hats to as chairman of the um, Planning Commission. Um, we have an ongoing project that you may or may not be aware of where the Planning Commission is working with the Select Board and the Town Manager and other groups to improve the traffic and pedestrian safety. We've made some recommendations with Select Board has approved already and in the process being implemented. We have other ones we're working on. And we have one open seat that's going bidding right now, and you can bribe me to try to get on to the Planning Commission, or you can just go to the Select Board and get on for free. But we definitely <laughs> need more voices, more experience, more solutions, because the quote-unquote blinking light is just one of the many areas where we have a problem with issues of pedestrians um, crossing safely and traffic um, going through the village safely. Um, so we'd love to have anybody, um, different views to help us with that. Uh, just, just a quick response to a couple things to Brad's comment about the people crossing at the light. We did, uh, Tom's crew did a great job putting up a split rail fence at the edge of the parking lot to try to discourage people from climbing up over the bank. Uh, it seems to have very little effect. I thought it would have more. Um, and to Rose's uh, uh, comment about how do we get more participation in town meeting, I think that's a great thing for everybody to think about. And I'll put out there that we, the, we, the select board, set the time and place of the meeting around the first of the year. I don't remember the exact date, but basically we have, you know, through this year to figure out ways that we could improve participation. Um, I assume that most people here this time, this works for you because you're here. But if you reach out to your friends and neighbors and there's a way to, to make it better, let us know. Also, Sherry's asking me to remind people that we could be moving town meeting to the townhouse, back to the townhouse next year because uh, it'd be ready to receive that and we could have a live feed for the um, ACTV from there, which we don't have from here. Um, anyway, that's it. Thank you. Rob? You got your steps in today, Opie. I'm just going to give you a microphone next year. Thank you. 
On a positive note, I would like to thank the select board and in particular the highway department for the yeoman's work they did on sidewalks and curbs in uh, last summer and uh, in an effort to save taxpayers money because of the price of concrete. And I want to know it doesn't go unappreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Over there. Hi, Ann Gilchrist here. That town hall business and people going there for a meeting, where are they going to park? And you look around here, a lot of us are on the older side. Where are we going to park and walk to that place safely? I think this place here seems to serve the best for our community. Thank you. Oh, Chip is here. All right. Okay. Karen Coburn, Collier. Um, I would agree with Ann. As much as I love the townhouse and it's in a beautiful, beautiful building, this is just so much easier for people to get in and out of the aisles to go get some food, go to the bathroom, whatever. The townhouse just is not conducive to sit down. Once you sit, you're there. You're not getting up and, and moving, going out go to the bathroom. God forbid if you have to, because you're moving an awful lot of people to get, to get out. Um, I love it. I love the building. It's gorgeous, but it's not the place to have the town meeting. At this time, our representative is here. So if there is no objection, I will allow Chip to speak to us as he is not a Hardwick resident or voter. And Chip, you have the podium. Pardon? If that's what your wish is. Do you want Chip to be part of the meeting or do you wish to adjourn and then let Chip speak? Okay, I need a motion to do so. We need a motion to adjourn. No, a motion to adjourn. I need a motion to adjourn if that is the wish of the party, of the gathering. I have a motion to adjourn from Rob. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of adjourning at 11.45, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those, those opposed, nay. 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 We are not adjourned. Chip, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's really good to be back in Hardwick um, after two or three years of absence uh, and not having meetings to visit with uh, my neighbors and constituents. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. And I, I, I have just, we just this July celebrated our 50th year in Standard, Vermont. And uh, I'm really a proud Standard residence, uh, resident. And I'm proud and, and gratified to represent Hardwick in the legislature. So um, this year, this fall, um, the speaker came to me and asked if I would be willing to move committees. And she asked me if I would uh, take the job as vice chair of the Corrections and Institutions Committee, which is quite a change for me. I've served uh, eight years on policy committees, four years on human services, and four years on house, uh, general housing and military affairs, where we dealt only with policy. Um, Corrections and Institutions Committee, however, uh, deals with what's called the capital budget. The capital budget uh, bonds $126 million this year in support of uh, all the state buildings. Um, uh, uh, general, uh, uh, we, uh, every state building, uh, we have a piece of, uh, of water and, uh, and uh, wastewater and drinking water. We've got a piece of uh, state parks, buildings and state parks, all the correctional facilities. Uh, and the courthouses. So um, it, we're, we're right now we're constructing a budget, and uh, we're uh, attempting to 
um, fulfill the needs of uh, lots of buildings, older buildings with deferred maintenance. And, uh, and um, uh, we're trying to, one of the uh, main issues on our agenda right now is uh, the women's correctional facility in, uh, in uh, South Burlington. Um, it, is, it was constructed in the early 70s, so it's you know, way too old, way past its, its prime. And uh, what's happening is the conditions in that facility are becoming inhumane. We have 100 women incarcerated there, and um, about uh, half of them are uh, being detained, actually, and they're not sentenced. So uh, we're looking at, uh, in general, we see uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Commissioner of Corrections just about every day. And what's happening now uh, with him leading the way is that we are looking at a little bit of a different approach in corrections. Um, there's a, there's a recruitment pri a, a crisis uh, for our corrections. And you can imagine what a, what a job lo is like when you're locked into a facility for 12, and now we're finding uh, days are running 12 and 16 hours each day. So um, we're having such a crisis that um, some of the units in, these, uh, in our correctional facilities are being closed down. So the women are in, in particular crisis. So we're looking at a little bit of a softer approach. We find that from uh, Norway and Sweden and Finland, all through Scandinavia, that they use a different approach. They, they have, and they, there's less contact and there's less conflict between staff and inmates. And it works better for everyone. So we're trying to move uh, forward uh, in a women's facility that will have a reentry program that will have that approach. It'll be um, a little bit uh, softer approach. Um, it won't be um, locking steel doors behind you. It won't be gray painted uh, cinder block. I mean, it's just, it's just a, an approach that has proven to be uh, better uh, in, on both sides. So we're moving forward on that. Um, construction projects right now uh, are moving at a rate of about five years from uh, concept to uh, completion. Um, and so um, we won't be moving forward with that for a while, uh, but we are looking for a location for the, uh, for the correctional facility and such. Um, and one of the other pieces are we are, uh, I'm, I'm working on a bill that would ask uh, uh, Building and General Services, um, uh, who uh, maintain and own most of the state buildings, to move toward a greener energy um, so that when, um, uh, when heating units have to be replaced, that they should uh, be looking at alternative uh, heat sources uh, to heat their buildings. And they are paying attention. And what we're finding out is that um, there's a, a massive new um, state police barracks in Williston that's being, uh, b being built. And that's going to be powered by five geothermal wells. Um, we also have um, a, a secure juvenile facility in Essex. And that's going to be powered by five geothermal wells. So uh, when we have uh, uh, the uh, commissioner and, uh, in and she tells us about um, certain boilers that are going to re be replaced by pellet, uh, 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 by pellet units and, and chunk wood units and such. So uh, it's encouraging that we are moving forward uh, to some greener energy within our state buildings. So um, I'll get right to uh, housing is, uh, is on a lot of people's mind. Um, having come four years on general housing and military affairs, I, I know that we put, um, we created about 2,800 uh, new uh, uh, living units uh, in the state in the past four years. And we did that <clears throat> in part with about $300 million that came to the Vermont as a result of the uh, CARES um, uh, COVID relief money and the, uh, and the uh, uh, ARPA funds that have come through, come in. So um, we are uh, thinking in, in terms, uh, we're trying to think in terms of what worked and what didn't work. So what we do have is a, a program called VHIP. VHIP uh, will um, uh, grant uh, loans and, and grants to landlords who um, have uh, apartment units that are offline for code violations or such. Uh, so with a 20 uh, uh, with a 20 percent uh, con contribution, uh, they can move forward, and we have created about 400 uh, new uh, reuse apartment. Uh, Com uh, apartments uh, as a result of that program. It's working and we're going to put a little bit more money into it and keep it going. Uh, we've heard from a lot of folks who are working people and um, they can't afford to buy a house. Um, uh, they, we're told that uh, the average uh, price to build a house right now is about $325,000 to $400,000. Um, so um, in that case, what we're looking at is uh, first generation home buyers 
uh, should be able to, um, uh, we should be able to um, make some loans to them for down payments and move them into uh, newly formed houses uh, because oftentimes they're, they're both uh, working people and uh, they have an income, but they just can't afford to uh, pull the trigger and build a house. Uh, so that's kind of what's happening. The other piece of the housing um, uh, that's coming in, in is that um, it, housing clusters is being looked at. So uh, it makes sense that we um, increase our housing units um, in downtown areas. Uh, and the reason is that, and it makes all the sense in the world when you think about it, it's um, when you can walk to the store, when you can walk to the doctor's office, when you can walk to the drugstore, and you can and you get around town, <clears throat> the town where you live, it makes all the sense to create more units and, and, a, a, and a more reasonable uh, environment uh, to uh, create new houses. Uh, that includes uh, accessory dwelling units, which are uh, garages and barns that can be uh, that can get uh, grant money to uh, to convert them into uh, living units. Um, Childcare is uh, one of the other um, pieces that are on our uh, that are on our radar right now. So, <clears throat> in the childcare, there was a study. There was a RAND study that came out this year, um, and it told us what we needed to do. And so, what we're trying to do is move on that in the best way we can uh, without um, uh, or, or, or the most affordable way we can. So some of the things that are being suggested that in this bill is that we move <clears throat> four-year-olds to our pre-K program and we make our pre-K program a full day. Pre-K has been administered by the um, Department of Children and Families and the Department of Education. This co-sponsorship um, has been has not been, proved to be uh, very effective. Um, there's all kinds of conflict there, and it really, uh, our, our pre-K system right now is not um, functioning the way it needs to. So moving four-year-olds uh, four, four into that uh, program, making it a full day, and um, opens up, um, opens up uh, slots uh, in daycare providers, uh, which can move uh, our other children into. The goal of this, I mean, it'll, it will incentivize um, Home care providers and daycare centers all over the state. It will incent it will increase um, uh, uh, the uh, qualifications or the uh, and expectations that uh, people um, uh, will need to uh, put their children into daycare. And the overall goal is that no family in Vermont should spend more than 10 percent of their income on childcare. We just can't do that. We can't. I mean, young couples. I I I go to the farmers market and I see young young folks with children, and I, I go in and introduce myself and I start talking with them. And I remember this one woman. She said, "My my husband runs a business, and uh, I have to work to keep our health care. I have to work my job to keep, but my entire salary goes to childcare for our two children. Really, we can't have that. That's not that's not the way it should be." And so what we're looking at is that uh, right now, families are paying um, 20, 30% of their salary, uh, their entire salary uh, for childcare. And, and that's, that's not okay. We need to uh, move uh, to have uh, childcare um, uh, more affordable. Um, education. Uh, in 2007, uh, the state of Vermont, uh, um, uh, they, uh, we uh, halted uh, the um, program that had provided too close here. <laughs> um, the program that had provided 30% uh, um, of uh, new uh, school construction uh, from the state of Vermont. Uh, that halted in 2007. And what we found is that a lot of these, a lot of our school buildings, which were built around the same time, are really starting to age out. They're really starting to suffer 20, 30, 40 years uh, old and the, you know, the roofs and whatnot. So uh, we are now looking again at a program modeled after Rhode Island, which is, which will, uh, the state will <clears throat> kick in 30 to 35% of any uh, school, <clears throat> school uh, building project. Uh, I think that's a worthwhile um, uh, effort. And I think that um, once again, our communities will be supported by the state of Vermont and, and a little bit um, outside of their ability to raise funds uh, through taxes. Um, so let's see what else um, we um, uh, let's see so um, the elephant in the room is what's known as the Affordable Heating Act the Affordable Heat Act and so um, I've engaged at the uh, last two towns that I, I was at I engaged with that 
And um, people are concerned, and I've had emails coming through as a result of that, and uh, uh, I, I, I want to say that I had an email from our Senator, Jane Kitchell, uh, and she kind of stands where I do. Um, I'm a member of the Climate Caucus, and I know that we, uh, the state of Vermont is obligated under the Clean Heat Standards Act of 1920, uh, 2020, <laughs> um, to, uh, to reduce carbon emissions by 2030, and then again by 2050. This is the law. This is what we have to comply with. So not a lot has been done, and um, a lot has, uh, this year has uh, come, to, uh, <coughs> come to the fore on, in the way of this Clean, uh, Affordable Heat Act. Um, there are some good things about it, and there are some not so good things about it. I have made it known um, to our caucus that um, raising the price of fuel oil right now um, for low-income Vermonters is not a real good way to go. Um, and if you're facing a, uh, uh, an oil fill-up every month or so at the, to the tune of $1,500, um, that's certainly not going to bear any increase. So uh, what has happened now, as, it, as this bill came out of the Senate, um, it has a step back, as the governor actually asked them to do, and it will um, uh, commission a study for the next two years with the Climate Council and the Public Service uh, Board, uh, Utilities Board, uh, to uh, work this up and to see what we can do to move forward by um, have, uh, helping Vermonters um, use a more green uh, or a non-fossil fuel to heat their homes and um, in, in whatever way they can. So what is acceptable is chunk wood, uh, pellets, um, and um, uh, wood chips, and heat pumps. So uh, the other problem I have is that moving into heat pumps is a, a, can be an expensive um, uh, issue. I mean, it, it really can be. Um, I was fortunate. Um, what I've done is um, I uh, installed a solar tracker. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll outlive the note that's paying for it. But um, uh, then I installed a heat pump. And um, for December and January, I heated and powered my house um, and got a credit from the electric company for the power that I had made over the, over the summer. So for December and January this year, it cost me nothing to heat and power my house. So when we move toward that um, and, and think in those terms, it's really an important piece that we can do, and it's, you know, uh, it, 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 it feels right. Uh, some of the, one of the other issues that we need to deal with is that um, if you don't, if you can't create your own electricity, we have to solve the issue uh, that um, uh, electricity, to make electricity more affordable so that if you do install a heat pump, uh, you're not, uh, you're not, it's not driving you to the bank because it can be more expensive. But my thoughts are that if, if, if you need to replace your furnace in your home, Price right now is probably $8,000 for a new oil furnace. So I think the method is to have Vermonters look at what they've got and what they and they where they want to go. And if you're going to be looking at eight or ten thousand dollars to uh, to replace your uh, your heating unit in your home, you certainly would be worthwhile looking at um, alternative uh, heat sources. Uh, and um, I'm sure what we what we will see is. Um, uh, credits and, uh, and um, incentives in order to make that move. Um, so what else? Uh, I can open up to questions. I don't want to keep folks here too long um, and see uh, if we can create some dialogue and uh, if anyone um, wants to. Uh, yes, Nancy. Chip, you said that you are the co-chair or vice chair of the um, Corrections, Corrections and Committee. Who is yes. the chair? Uh, Alice Emmons. She's the dean of the house. She's been there 40 years. And, <laughs> and I sit next to her. Whereabouts is she from? She's from Springfield. Okay. Um, and how would a citizen input the Climate Council. Say that again. I didn't quite hear the, you. Nancy. The Climate Council that you mentioned that you were on. That um, uh, how I, would how would a citizen input? I mean, um, we have I, we have um, an insulation issue. I mean, it. You didn't mention that the 
heat pumps only work are only are efficient over 17 degrees or yeah down to 17 degrees and then it becomes a an okay, equation well where that it, it takes more electricity and yeah, the grid yeah. and blah 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 you yeah. know the well that's not in, entirely accurate i i put a facitu uh, heat pump in my house which is good to zero and we had those very cold nights really uh, it was still putting out warm air i had to call on my backup furnace uh, to heat the house at that time but uh, you know down to um, teens and and close to zero this heat pump has been putting out more uh, hot air um, so the new units are much more efficient and they are much more uh, cold weather oriented. So, so it's no um, longer 17 degrees at this point. This climate council that yeah. you mentioned, how, where, how would a citizen input that? Okay, so um, if you send me an email, Nancy, I will get that answer for you because I don't have it right now. Okay. How you could contact them directly, I don't know. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I forget what you said about the uh, the help for off-grid people, which we have quite a few people who are off-grid, you know, not contemplating, but anticipating the, the final collapse, you know, that I've been told not to talk about or not to use that word, but I mean, the trajectory is that it is is obvious, you know. Well, it came, it came up in Walden that um, you know if you heat your house if you're off the grid and you have a generator and you heat your house with wood, um, nothing will impact you as a result of this uh, clean affordable heat act. Um, there, um, it, it will uh, you just continue as you are right now. Uh, chunk wood is considered to be renewable energy and is uh, actually looked at as a uh, as a an acceptable fuel. So the Affordable Heating Act that you are in the process of developing or submitting. So a bill came out of the Senate. It was a, their bill S sixty six came out of the Senate this week. And what it did was it put up a, a pause on any activity um, uh, for the next two years so it can be studied. I really think we need to look at this. I think we need to see how we don't burden Vermonters uh, okay. with an attempt to clean our carbon uh, footprint. Uh, heating and, and, and motor vehicles are the uh, two of the uh, main uh, causes of, of carbon uh, emissions in, in, in everywhere in the country. Um, at Vermont actually ha does not have a, a very good record at that. Um, per capita, we, we release a fair amount of carbon into the air. Um, so uh, at this point, we will, um, I hope that these studies will come back to us and our Senator Jane Kitchell has um, uh, added an amendment to this that nothing be done, nothing be done until these reports come back to the legislature and the legislature can act on what they've got. So we will have an opportunity in two years to move forward on this if, in my opinion, if we can protect Vermonters and low-income in, low Vermonters from seeing an increase in fuel oil prices and, um, and we can incentivize uh, alternative fuel uh, uh, for, uh, heating systems that can accommodate folks and they can move into them when they, when they need a furnace. Well, weatherization will be part of it also. They're, they're, they're going to increase their weatherization force and get people and, and uh, enlarge the uh, income eligibility uh, for people to, uh, and provide loans for people to weatherize their homes. That's a big piece of this. You know, I, I, I foam uh, insulated my ba basement, which had one rubble wall, and uh, it's made a huge difference in my house. And I, Chip? Yes, I'm sorry, yep. Yes, sir. Sounds like we're paying you too much. Uh, who is responsible for what VTrans does? <laughs> My question is, the wonderful improvements that were done in Hardwick last summer are so anti-business I could spit. And I don't like it. I can only imagine what the business owners feel like 
But you talk about anti-business, taking parking spaces away from limited parking to begin with is ludicrous. Second of all, are there any plans in the legislature to modify the rules or eliminate completely Act 250? Okay, so um, I did touch on uh, downtown clusters. And in order to get there, in order to be able to do that, um, uh, a, fair number, a fair amount of uh, modifications to Act 250 are about to happen. Uh, the bill that's coming out of the Senate will have uh, modifications uh, to Act 250 that will allow uh, smaller, uh, smaller lots in, uh, in village uh, centers and, uh, and uh, various other uh, pieces that will, um, make, um, uh, will allow us to move forward on, on, on more housing units. So yes, there is a consideration not to do away with Act 250, uh, but to uh, modify it uh, with respect to uh, our ability to um, create downtown more housing units. How do we generate new business when the requirement under 250 basically boils down to eight years of planning and permits? Not many businesses will invest that time or have that kind of money to build a business here in Vermont. So um, I think eight years is a little bit long. Um, I, <laughs> we, can, we can negotiate that, I suspect. But yeah, I, I, I hear you. I think that uh, Act 250 has posed some issues uh, surrounding development. Um, and I do think that that's also being looked at. Um, but there are some pieces that come out uh, of some of these uh, discussions about Act 250 would really not enhance the rural character of our uh, uh, area right here, our district, uh, Hardwick, Standard, and Walden. So uh, we need to move forward carefully, but I do hear what you're saying, and I do think that um, we do need to um, uh, think twice about uh, the burden of, of permitting because I de I'm dealing with uh, building and general services every day in our committee now. And when they tell us it takes five years to move from a plan uh, to a completion of a, of a building, it really makes you stop and think. Um, and they have to go through the permitting process as well. So I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that there is a movement to, to, uh, to do some modifications. I don't think we'll see it go away. How about we, the state, provide for county drain commissioners for each county to help speed that process. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. Opie, uh, who do you have? Oh, yes, sir. Hey, Chip. Matt Hill. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, we were talking about the climate committee that you're on right now. Um, there's a bill that you put out, H-126. It talked about the 2030-2050 initiative about conserving 30% of the state land in 2030 and 50% of the state land in 2050. <clears throat> currently, I see the state land has 7.8% um, currently, so that's tripling the conservative amount in seven years. So I'm just looking to see what the mindset is to conserve that much land by seven years and 23 years. Are you talking about 30 by 30? Uh bill that's coming out? Correct. It's yeah. the H-126 yeah. you, you're on the committee yeah. of. If you could speak a little bit more about how we get to conserving 30 percent of the state and 50 percent of the state. I, I am familiar with that bill. So um, how we get there, uh, I think, um, you know, from where I stand, uh, being a landowner, uh, I, I'm there already. I, I'm thinking in terms of that this has mer merit. Um, wildlife car corridors, um, uh, require um, uh, prop uh, properties to, that are uh, in but each other to um, be able to uh, um, exist uh, and uh, and stay uh, stay intact. Um, and um, you know, 30 by 30, I think, has got a lot to do with um, having uh, um, uh, uh, green and trees that uh, take carbon out of the air. I mean, that's that's one of the missions for it. Um, I couldn't tell you how. We're going to get there. I don't know that much about it, but I, what I can do is give you one of my town meeting reports, and if you email me, I will get an answer for you. And, and I, I have emailed you about it, but um, I'm looking to see because we're talking how you can serve it. So when you say 7.8% now to 30% by 2030 and 50%, which is half the state, yep. 
I'm, I'm wondering what initiatives, is it by land vest? Is it by, how, how does the state control, because Vermont is mostly private land, and, and I'm looking to see how does the state control private land. So what kind of initiatives or um, controls do they put in play? And they, they mentioned, because this bill just created in January, so, and I know there's going to be three public meetings on it before they roll it out. Yep. So um, it's a huge land grab in my mind, but I'm looking for your clarification on this. Well, again, I, I, I couldn't do that for you today. What I'd have to do is, is take a closer look at the bill. That's uh, Representative Sheldon's bill. I have spoken to her a little bit about it. What I think would be the process would be to uh, ask Vermont landowners to volunteer. I don't think there's any kind of a land grab involved. The state is not going to be involved in taking anyone's land. I think that we're going to ask folks um, in an urgency to, um, to uh, keep land intact uh, so that uh, we can have uh, wildlife corridors and, and uh, green spaces that uh, we really need. I will, you email me and I will get back to you for sure. I, that's something I need to look into. I'm sorry that I don't have that information for you. Hi, uh, Mike DeMarco. Hi, Mike. Um, I am in full support of anything green and anything that can help get rid of carbon emissions. My concern is that a lot of these electric cars, heat pumps, many things that run off electricity are being supported by the state, the, go the federal government, and it's being pushed extremely hard right now. Where is this el excess electricity coming from? Because That's a great question. That's even a green electricity, wind, solar, needs to be supported by fossil fuels. I'm not sure how many people know this, but when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, we're still burning coal, gas, and anything else to get diesel generators, to get electricity, to support these clean running, or quote unquote, clean running things. And these things are only as clean as the electricity going into them. So my concern is where is this electricity coming from? Um, certainly, um that's a great question. And is there a plan? Well, well and what I mean, is that, the plan? that's what we're hoping we'll hear back. We don't know right now if the grid will accommodate um, electric use to that extent uh, without solar power. Uh, we also know that at, at the rate that electric uh, uh, utilities are charging right now, uh, installing a heat pump could be uh, prohibitively expensive, not only to install but to run throughout the throughout the a winter, a Vermont winter. So those are, the, those are two of the issues that I have a problem with personally, and that well, I'm hoping that we will hear back from this study ways that we can accommodate that. Um, and again, I, you know, there may be incentivizing heat pumps. I'm sure that will be part of it, um, because um, average Vermonter will have, would have a hard time paying for it. I've heard stories that of, of, uh, of um, estimates in the $20,000 range to uh, install heat pumps. But uh, what we do know is that, what I experienced is that with an open floor plan in my house, one, 20, one 12,000 BTU unit on my living room wall has heated the whole house this, uh, this uh, winter. So they're effective. If you're producing your own electricity, they're very effective. Uh, but you're right. Um, we don't know if the grid can accommodate that. That's one of the issues that the governor has, and I think it's legitimate. I think that we... <clears throat> We can't ask, if we can't ask people to, uh, uh, to uh, front the cost of a, of a heat pump, then we, can't, we also can't afford to have them uh, uh, pay uh, more than they normally would uh, to heat their homes. And again, that's part of my problem with it. Uh, we have to make sure that whatever the solution is that we move forward on will be a solution that will not burden Vermont Vermonters and as particularly low-income Vermonters. It's, it's my highest priority, and I've let everyone in the caucus know about that. When is that inquiry finished? Two years. Two years. So, Two years. so nothing will happen for three years. Uh, 2020, 2025 will be uh, where, where that might be enacted. And as I said, um, Senator Kitchell has put forward a bill that said that she wants a check back so that <clears throat> when this study is, uh, is complete, and, uh, and, and forwarded to us that nothing happens until the legislature acts on it. And we'll have, again, we'll have an, an opportunity to, to review this uh, bill uh, in a way that with two years more 
um, thought behind it, and hopefully with some more reasonable um, solutions to what we're trying to look at. Yes. Chip, I appreciate you bringing this up. I actually just wrote to Senator Kitchell about this act, and um, so I appreciate the feedback that you're giving. And I don't consider myself low income, but I would be strained to the max if something like this came about. Um, to have to replace my furnace, to have to get solar panels would just be beyond what I could afford to do. And so I appreciate that you're taking a break on this and actually looking at how it's going to affect Vermonters because that's what you need to look at is not how it's going to affect people who can afford to do it. That doesn't matter. They can afford to do whatever they want. It's the people who are living paycheck to paycheck or are trying to save, you know, in the future maybe I do want to do something like that, but I can't be forced to do it in a timeline that's not my own. Um, you know, if I can save up for it or get some kind of incentive to help it make it more financially feasible, that's something else. But to be forced to do something that I can't financially afford to do is not reasonable. So I appreciate that you're taking time to relook at it. I appreciate your input. Uh, understand no one will be forced to do anything. It'll always be a choice. The state will not impose uh, any, any heat requirements uh, on you. Uh, but, you know, um, I worked 35 years with um, low-income Vermonters. I worked four years on Human Services Committee with policies for low-income Vermonters, uh, housing in general, and military, uh, general housing and military affairs. All the policy committees I've had, my priority has always been for people um, of less means who will struggle with any initiatives that we put forward that would have a negative impact on them. And that has been where I've been at all the, for the whole nine years I've been at, and I, and I will stay there also. Um, hey, Chip. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for what you're doing. Um, it's nice to have an accessible voice in the legislature, and now I'm going to access that. Um, <laughs> I'm all in support of green energy in, I think, climate um, changes, which we're all seeing are huge. Uh, especially for what the next generations are going to go through. However, I think this, I agree with the emphasis on first electric vehicles and charging stations and now coming in for heating. Um, a lot of money is going in, which actually more accessible to people of the upper income groups easily. Um, I think the state has absolutely been negligent in ignoring mass transportation, which is upwards of 30% of our carbon in, uh, footprint for the entire state. And on top of that, according to, this is several years now, the state did a study that said the average cost of owning and maintaining a vehicle in the state of Vermont is $8,500. Most working families, both adults, have to work in there. That's $17,000. It's probably higher now. Maybe they don't have um, the upper range, but it's a huge amount of money coming out of their check to have usable commutal, commuting mass transportation addresses our carbon, puts income back into the pockets of working class Vermonters and relieves a lot of our social, economic, poverty, hunger problems. And I would like the state to really focus on commuting mass transportation, especially in rural areas, to go into perhaps maybe some of our larger metropolitan areas. So I, so I would agree. Um, you know, electric vehicles aren't for everyone. I'm not about to uh, purchase an electric vehicle. And you're right. All the incentives in the world uh, do not make them really that much more affordable for, uh, for an average person. So, um, you know, I do think that uh, you're right, that uh, people who can afford electric vehicles are the ones that have been buying them. Uh, and so that's helping some. Uh, I don't expect um, folks, um, average people, to uh, buy electric vehicles uh, at this point. But think in terms of what I've said about um, uh, housing development. If we develop our downtown clusters, if we enlarge housing for our, in our downtowns everywhere, everywhere in the state of Vermont, we will create more housing, 
and we will cut carbon footprint, our carbon footprint, because people will not have to get in their car and drive to the doctor, drive to the store, drive to the drugstore. That's part of what we're looking at right now, and that's part of what my agenda is. I mean, that's some of the thoughts that I have uh, surrounding um, uh, trying to get get where we need to be on this. So I, I hear you, David. I I, I don't disagree. Um, I, I'm not about to buy an electric car. <laughs> so. Okay. Hey, Chip. Hi, Brad. Um, so these comments, um, thank you for showing up and being here. Uh, these comments aren't directed toward you. They're directed toward Montpelier. Okay. And so I know... Thanks for the... I, I know that... Uh, well, no, seriously, I appreciate I, you being I, here and, and answering these questions and helping you. us That's understand cool. this. Yeah, thank you. Um, but one of the... Th you have to understand where the lack of trust comes from. Um, you have a, the Energy Committee, the Senators, uh, that whatever the name of that committee is, Energy or whatever it is, but they voted that bill out five to nothing. They were hell-bent on passing that bill. It didn't matter what they heard. And they heard everything that Senator Kitchell heard. But they were not willing to move on that or act on that. And thank God Senator Kitchell said, well, this is ridiculous because this is going to have a ridiculous impact on my constituents. And so she stopped that. But it, she had to buck her own party to do that, or at least that committee. So we all saw that playing out, and it was just very frustrating that the committee itself didn't take the time to put forward a bill that just more accurately reflected, or they weren't able to more accurately reflect and understand the impact that was going to have on us. Yeah. And so that's unfortunate. You have to understand where that lack of trust is coming from. And then the other is, you know, we're, to tell us that we are not being forced to do anything, I think is an unfortunate statement because I don't know how much the cost of fuel oil is gonna go up, but it's very clear that it's going to go up. And it's gonna go up to the point where it's going to force a lot of us to move away from using fuel oil, which is fine. But you are forcing us to move away from that because we will not be able to afford it. Now, we will make that final decision of when that point comes. But to say that we aren't being forced to do anything, I think is a little misleading, and I think we can see through that. And so there's where, you, again, a lack of trust of what we're seeing coming out of Montpelier. So just if you can be, as, as our legislators, as transparent as you possibly can and understand the concern that we all have and the fear that we have, and, and it's not just low income, that's going to be impacted by this. I mean, we hear low income all the time being protected, but it's the moderate income people who are also trying to put kids through school, trying to raise their kids, trying to pay a mortgage on a $300,000 house. Yeah. I mean, it all adds up. And so, anyway, I leave you with that. Again, thank you for, for being here. Well, thanks, Brad. You know, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate what you uh, said, and we've had conversations before where we have been uh, in agreement and, uh, and, and appreciate what each other have to say. And, I, and, and that's, a, that's a really a good thing. Um, you're right. There are some people in the, in the legislature that are ready to move on this no matter what. I'm not one of them. I can't, I, and I've told everyone that, I, I cannot support uh, a measure that's going to have a negative impact on our Vermonters and particularly our low-income Vermonters. And you're right, but when, when, it, when they got to, that bill got to the Florida Senate, what happened was that um, uh, they pulled it back, and that's when they commissioned this two-year study because they had a lot of unanswered questions and they really wanted to uh, not move forward on that at that point. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where the governor was coming from also. We need to step back and take a look at it. So, yes, I, you know, I agree um, that uh, it's probably legitimate to have a feeling that uh, Montpelier is not listening to you at some point in time. Uh, I try to. I, mean, I answer everyone's emails. Um, I hear what the people say. You and I have had an exchange on a couple of bills that um, I have respected your input. And, um, you know, I try to do that with everyone. And um, this, this bill um, will, um, I will not support it if it's not the right measures for Vermonters. It's just the way it is. It's the way I am. Yes, okay. Yep. Hi, Hi Mary. Mary Gagnon. Um, first, just a real quick um, touch on the energy um, piece is I was wondering if, if there's any um, connection being made for the support of the um, extra housing, you know, the, the mother-in-law units um, being developed on, on 
lands that already are developed um, to be made sustainable in their energy use um, to make the sustainability tied to the um, financial support that the state is considering or efficiency Vermont may be getting involved um, with some of the the financing help being tied to having sustainable energy in these newly developed um, augmenting augmented housing. I'm not sure that I understand your question. If and I'm having a little hard. If time we're going to make um, hold the mic down a little bit further. If we're going to make move the mic category. Uh, if we're going to make um, help for people to develop. The, I, I read in seven days uh -huh. that okay. there was a, like a $50,000 yeah. yeah. grants or something that could be applied yes. to, to help um, people develop their garage, say, yes. into, a, into a housing unit. Yep. That could, could there be a measure where that, where we're developing something new that isn't already in existence, where it isn't going to impact somebody who's already living there, have the incentives and the help and the, um, you know, efficiency Vermont or whatever that we can do it before people are in and settled in, in a budget situation that, you know, we don't disrupt that. I, I thought that might be a, a good direction to take. If you have a garage and you want to turn it into a dwelling unit, uh, the bills that are being uh, coming through the legislature right now will allow you to do that and could provide a 50, up to $50,000 uh, loan or grant, depending on who you rent it to, mm -hmm. um, to complete that project. Same with an old barn. So that's um, a way that we're trying to create new housing in, in areas uh, that, um, that uh, we need to identify and, and, uh, and set up new housing in. My question was about whether we could tie that to our efforts to go into more sustainable energy use, you know, okay, use yeah, some yeah. of those yeah. processes yeah. in these new dwellings. Well, as I said to David, you know, if you are creating housing units in downtown uh, where uh, you can walk to the store, walk to the drugstore, walk to the doctor's appointment, then you're not climbing into your car and you're not creating carbon emissions right. as a result of traveling 15 miles down the road mm -hmm. to get there. So that is part of the carbon uh, solution as well, if we if we right. move to downtown clusters. Yeah. Um, I also um, just wondered if you might uh, give us a, a, a review of the um, election uh, financing uh, that just came oh, out. Oh, yeah, draft yeah we had an exchange about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Mary. You. Sorry to keep that so long. Thanks, so nice. yeah, Is this yours? Oh, yeah. So um, I just want to mention I have uh, town meeting reports here. Um, they have my contact information on the back. If there's any unsettled issues, if there are any questions, please, I'll leave them on the table uh, back. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. We'll get back to you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you, Chip. Having. Again, we're on Article 21. Is there any other business to come before this meeting? A motion to adjourn would be in order. I have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. And we are adjourned at 1232. And remember, there is lunch in the lobby and other information. And thank you for your time and support. Thank you.